I'm Ted Rosen. I'm from the Republic of Texas. I'm on the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine, where I've been since the War of Northern Aggression. It's really subjective, right, you know, what's really meaningful, but we do our best to try and pick literature that's interesting or might impact your practice. So I like to group mine in, in little aliquots. So we're going to talk about patient care. There's me giving patient care on Halloween. I dress up on Halloween. People sign up a year in advance, and all, the whole staff dresses up, and we have a good time. I think a happy office is a productive office. So I thought this was an interesting article. What do patients prefer we wear? And so it was a single center, so it might be different in North Dakota than it is in Miami. And it wasn't huge, but it was, you know, 250 odd people. And the patients in all settings, all settings, medical and the surgical operating suite, so we're not in a laminar flow OR, uh, and during a wound care clinic, they preferred professional attire, i.e. a white coat and appropriate dress clothes. Even in the surgical suite, they would like you to walk in with a white coat and then go into your surgical scrubs. Casual, not too terribly well received. So the message is they want us to look professional. Okay, like this. This is not a tremendously wonderful article, but since I wrote it, I had to put it in here. Um, it's a really good one to print out and keep in the office as reference because it tells you, it gives you clues about what to do to prevent needle stick injuries, and it spells out the protocols for what to do regarding hepatitis and HIV, the current most recent protocols. And it's a nice one just to print out and keep around for a reference. So I would urge you to do that. Also, it'll get a bunch of hits that way and I'll be popular and famous. Okay, oh, we've got a lot of people who don't have beards. Well, you can take this back to the bearded people in your office and those who are here who have beards. This is an interesting question. This is from the orthopedic literature. And they were thinking, you know, if you have beards, maybe you have a bunch of bacteria in there and you have to be real careful. And so what they did is they took folks who were clean shaven, had beards, or had beards, and they had them do three different head movements, like this, and like this, and like this, for 90 seconds, assuming they didn't break their cervical spine. And they did this right under a blood auger plate. And they did masked, unmasked, or masked with a hood. And they wanted to see how many bacteria or colony forming units would occur. And do you really need a hood? Is a mask sufficient if you're bearded? Or do you need to you know, wear a cinder block or something? And here's what they found, and it was pretty interesting. There was no difference between bacterial shedding if you were bearded or clean shaven, as long as you wore a mask, the red, the, the blue is the clean shaven, the red is the bearded people. So if, was, if you wore a mask, there was no difference. Addition of that hood didn't reduce shedding anymore. It's almost exactly the same. So you don't need to wear a hood. But look at the last one. With no mask, if you're bearded, the big red column there, you shed more bacteria. So the bottom line is you need a mask. Everybody should wear a mask. I think we do it anyhow, but this really proves that you should, and it also shows you don't need anything more than that if you're bearded. And that was very, very, very comforting to me because that way, even at my fuzziest, <laughs> I can go ahead and do surgery as long as I'm wearing a mask. Of course, you have to put a pretty big mask to kind of cover that kind of... Uh, I, do a job as Santa over the Christmas holidays to make money. Okay, sunburn. Sunburn causes cancer. Well, somebody's gonna ask you, well, prove it. Do you have any evidence of that? And these are long prospective studies, one involving women, one involving men, and they said that if you had 10 or more blistering, painful sunburns for men, or six or more for women, that was the criteria. What is your risk? And your risk of melanoma was substantially greater than if you didn't have that history. Somewhat less, but also increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. So blistering, painful sunburns are in fact, in, do increase your risk 
of non-melanoma skin cancer and melanoma, and worse with melanoma, actually, and the worst was the trunk. So there's evidence, you don't have to guess. Where are non-melanoma skin cancers going to occur? Now, this was a study done in Australia, but I seriously doubt that it would change in the US. They had 37,000 participants. You know, it's not an N8, it's a bunch of people. And they found basal cell and squamous cell in the head and neck, as we'd expect. But on the back, in particular, it was eight to one basal cell to squamous cell. And on the dorsum of the hand, it was 14 to one squamous cell to basal cell. And I, I think this is important. Some people would say cutaneous squamous cell that's actinic keratosis. In a non-transplant patient, you can do curatage and desiccation. Some would say that's too dangerous. You know, you really need to excise these, maybe have most surgery on many of them, certainly on the head and neck. And if you're approaching a lesion on the dorsum of the hand and you're not sure what it is, it's probably a squamous cell, according to this. And if you're approaching a lesion on the back, it's probably a basal cell. It isn't that it can't be the other one, but it kind of gives you an idea where these are most likely and where you might have to think a little harder about what therapeutic intervention you entertain. I thought this was fabulous. From a skin cancer standpoint, which car is safer? Mercedes-Benz, Lexus, or BMW? Mercedes, Lexus, they all look, BMW, they all look overpriced and beautiful. So which one is better? And this came from the ophthalmology literature. So going outside the derm literature is fun sometimes. And it turns out, let me just summarize this, the front window in almost every car known to mankind really does a pretty good job of filtering out UV, 95 to 98%. Where the problem comes are the side windows. And there it's quite variable. It's as low as 44% and as high as nearly 100% filtering out UV, average being 71. So it's really those side windows that are the problem. The best for filtering was Lexus, and Mercedes-Benz and BMW were on a par with Volkswagen. Those were the worst three. So just saying, if you got a Benz, take it in, trade it in, get a Lexus. Okay, PD-1 blockade, we're actually gonna talk a lot about this in new drugs and we'll mention it in cutaneous oncology as well. Just remember that this is a new approach to Merkel cell carcinoma. So you're basically interfering with the tumor's ability to suppress immune response mediated by lymphocytes, and it's a blocker. And this was, so it's a small N, but then it's hard to get a whole bunch of Merkel cell carcinoma patients around. This is traditionally, if you don't get it with surgery the first time around, this is traditionally a really hard thing to treat. And it turns out they had a pretty decent response. Almost 60% had some objective response, and four out of 26, it's an N of 26, completely responded. And this was fairly durable, so even at six months, two-thirds were surviving, and most of them should have been dead. So this is nice. It's a, a nice way to treat this, and it blocks this interaction uh, with the tumor cell and the lymphocyte in a way that the lymphocyte now should do its job and go ahead and attack the tumor. And we'll talk more about this later, and this is a new drug that was approved for Merkel cell, which we'll, again, talk a little bit more about later. How about alcohol? You know, does alcohol increase the risk of anything dermatological? And they were looking at melanoma. And, you know, it's a lot of person years. It's three studies combined. And it turns out that alcohol ingestion increases your risk of melanoma to some extent, greatest on the trunk and greatest with white wine. So I guess vodka's okay, red wine's fine. Um, you know, it's a modest effect, but it does increase melanoma. And I guess the thing that would be important here is if you have somebody that's had a melanoma that's kind of iffy and you were worried about them anyhow, um, it would be best to advise them to curtail their alcohol intake, particularly white wine. Well, this kind of goes along with good news, bad news. So the bad news is people love to drink while they're outside. Just love it. The good news is a lot of beaches, anyhow, more for safety that they don't drown, are now 
prohibiting the con ingestion of alcohol while you're out in the sun uh, at the beach. So we're getting a little help from the beach authorities, not much help from the pool people. How about a second melanoma? What if you have one? What's your risk of a second? And this was a Dutch study. They have a very controlled system so they can gather data very, very easily. And the cumulative risk after 10 years, if you had one melanoma of getting a second, was about four to five percent. The interesting thing that it, what came out of this study was that in situ melanomas, which we think of as relatively easy to treat, small margin excision, you're done, you don't have to worry, but the risk of developing a second melanoma after having an in situ melanoma, your only melanoma before that, actually persisted for 10 years compared to a, the population that didn't have an in situ melanoma. Age, sex, occupation, exposure to sunlight, all that corrected for. So even with an in situ melanoma, you ought to keep seeing these patients in follow-up, which typically we don't recommend. We do for invasive melanoma, but even for in situ melanoma. Okay, topical amicomot as a treatment for lentigo maligna. So this was a very small scale phase two British study that was supposed to lead to a phase three study. That's what it was supposed to do. And what they did is they treated lentigo maligna with 5% of micomod five times a week. They gave them Saturday and Sunday off for good behavior for 12 weeks. And it turns out the pathologic cure rate was about a third. And the authors said, this shows imiquimod should not be used for lentigo maligna. Now, in some places in the US, Dartmouth is one example, University of Oklahoma is another example, they do this routinely. So one could say, first of all, the study might be flawed because instead of doing it five days, maybe you need to do it seven days. Or instead of uh, 12 weeks, maybe you need to do it 16 weeks or 20 weeks. So their parameters might be wrong. But the one thing they didn't address at all was the use of this as an adjunct to surgery. And we do that in our, in our own department. So you can chase after a lenigo maligna forever. You just keep following and following. You keep getting a few funny cells. You take the whole face off and you haven't read. Some of the big ones, you haven't finished with it. So we use it as an adjunct at the periphery because there is response, but we don't use it as a primary therapy and they didn't recommend it either. So not a very positive result, but an interesting result. And then, this was good, which is worse? These are two squamous cell carcinoma. One has a horn on it and one doesn't. Which one's worse? Well, it turns out that the ones with the horns are less deeply invasive. They have a smaller diameter. They tend to be better differentiated. That wasn't statistically significant. It was a strong trend. The others were statistically significant. So the message is a squamous cell carcinoma surmounted by a cutaneous horn is less likely to be a high-risk lesion compared to a comparable one that doesn't have a horn. The criticism of this study is, well, maybe those little horns call attention to it sooner, and you're getting kind of earlier lesions. But you know, you're still going to treat it, but maybe it's a little less risky. How about cryosurgery? This was part of an inginal mebutate plus cryo study, and one of the things they looked at was how much cryo is necessary. And their conclusion was that aggressive cryosurgery is better in terms of increasing clearance rates of AKs on the face and scalp. So what's aggressive, you ask? This is aggressive. <laughs> That's aggressive. That's eight seconds. How many of you freeze that long with your AKs? I don't see a lot of hands. Anybody? Yeah, me neither. So the bottom line is maybe we should be freezing a little longer. The bottom, bottom number for them was five seconds and one to four wasn't as good seconds. Double freeze thaw they thought was better than single freeze thaw. This is a fascinating small observation from Israel. They looked at patients who had mycosis fungoides. In Israel, service in the military is compulsory. Unless you have some major medical reason, you serve. Male, female, doesn't matter. Everybody serves. So they found people who had MF, and they went back with their military history, and they found out what they did. And all of them, five out of five, 
were being exposed to aromatic hydrocarbons, like jet fuel, hydraulic oils. They all worked in the Air Force. So I don't know if this is true or not, but it's an interesting observation. And your next CTCL slash MF patient, ask if they served in the military or occupationally if they were exposed to things like benzene, cresol, xylene, toluene, these sort of hydrocarbon products. And you know, if you start seeing this, write a letter somewhere, get it published, maybe that's a major risk factor. Interesting, provocative. Okay, this one is important, it really is. When you give isotretinoin, by show of hands, how many of you check triglycerides serially? Okay, we're all doing the wrong thing. So they looked at this and they reviewed, they found 26 cases of pancreatitis. That's why we're checking triglycerides, along with, you don't want them to be sky high. But it's really, the theory goes, if you find someone's triglycerides rising, rising, I was taught 700, maybe it's 800, who knows. But at that point, to prevent pancreatitis, you should stop the drug. Well, it turns out they found these 26 cases of pancreatitis linked to isotretinoin. Four of them were attributed to elevated triglycerides, so the majority of them didn't even have elevated triglycerides. Two of those patients had elevated triglycerides before they took isotretinoin number one. So their conclusion was that patients on isotretinoin can develop idiosyncratic pancreatitis, and that's not related to triglycerides. So if you're, if you're monitoring triglycerides solely to prevent pancreatitis, you're doing something unnecessary. On the other hand, and this is my cautionary comment, in the medical legal climate we all practice in, if you don't do that, you're bucking the trend. Almost 100% of you raised your hands because that's considered good standard of care. But maybe we don't have to do it. So provocative also, and I think interesting and thought provoking. This is the domino trial. Minocycline compared to modified release doxycycline, so that's our ratio, 100 milligrams of minocycline versus our ratio, 16 weeks. Then they waited, they stopped both drugs and they waited 12 weeks to see what happened. Basically, as you might expect, the two drugs did just equally fine during the active treatment phase, although a little bit of the global assessment actually favored minocycline, but it wasn't striking. What was striking is when they stopped the drug and then they followed the people for 12 weeks, 6.7% relapsed if they had taken minocycline 48% relapsed if they had taken modified release low dose doxycycline. So I'm just saying, minocycline actually certainly was non inferior during the active phase and actually was better if you looked at relapse. Still, minocycline remains the second agent because of vestibular and other risks, autoimmune phenomenon. But less relapse. If you have prompt relapse when you try discontinuing doxy, particularly the modified release version, this is another option. Psoriasis, good news, bad news, in between news. Statins, if they have psoriatic arthritis, uh, probably help the psoriatic arthritis above and beyond helping their dyslipidemia. This was an important article. I put it in, in psoriasis because we're worried about the IL-17 blockers perhaps increasing the risk of candida infections. That includes cutaneous candidiasis, thrush, and vulvovaginal candidiasis. And how do you treat those? You treat them differently. These are the recommendations from the Infectious Disease Society of America. Cutaneous skin, axilla, under pendulous breasts, upper inner groin, cutaneous candidiasis, 100 milligrams a day for three to seven days, the longer duration if it's more severe. Oropharyngeal, thrush, it's 150 milligrams a day, seven to 14 days, longer duration if it's more severe. Honestly, I treat the skin with 152 because the generic 100s and 50s are so inexpensive that it's just simpler to do that. And then for vulvovaginal candidiasis, acute onset, first episode, single 150 milligrams. If it's really, really bad though, it's 150 milligrams every three days for three doses. 
and that's not what we normally think about for vulvovaginal vaginal candidiasis. So if your patient's on an IL-17, or heck, if they're on an antibiotic, and they get secondary candida infection and it's really severe, skin, throat, vulvovaginal, here are the doses. Atopic dermatitis, smoking, you know, smoking just isn't a good thing. And two things it does. It helps reduce the recurrence of aphthostomatitis in people who have a lot of aphthostomatitis, and it actually reduces the risk of inflammatory bowel disease in people who are genetically predisposed. Other than that, nicotine's nasty. And this was looking at smoking in atopic dermatitis, and it turns out that smokers who have AD, teens and adults, or even kids who are associated with passive smoke exposure increases the severity, all other things being equal, increases the severity of their atopy and lends itself to persistence of the disease. Speaking of atopy and treatment, there's ustekinumab, small study, N of 10. These were really bad atopics. They failed all those things listed there. Mycophenolate, cyclosporin, methotrexate, etanercept, azathioprine. Four out of 10 were clear, almost cleansed. Six out of 10 didn't respond. So the message here is ustekinumab may be helpful. It's another new thing you can use for atopic dermatitis, but it may not be the killer drug. And then increased risk of infections in atopic dermatitis, some we look for, right? Impetigo, molluscum, we kind of expect that. But this is also increased risk of strep pharyngitis and otitis media, 200%. Now that might be because they're scratching in their ear, possibly, but we have to think about infections of all kinds in atopic dermatitis patients. But from the family medicine literature, they took a bunch of mildly infected eczema patients. Now, this is coming from Wales. It's the, the family practice literature. Don't know how good it is, but they did topical antibiotic, and they used fusidic acid, which we, we don't have here, but it's a pretty good topical antibiotic, plus a placebo pill an oral antibiotic, placebo cream, or placebo both, and there was no out difference in the outcome. So they said don't rush to treat mildly infected eczema. Collagen vascular, I just want to show this because I thought it was fascinating. They looked at systemic lupus erythematosus and the outcome being death. And people who had a low level of serum lycopenes were at a much increased risk. 33 and a third over a long period of time, 12 to 18 years, of dying of their disease. Everything else was matched, age, sex, how severe their lupus was, what organs were involved in enrollment, and those who had high level of lycopenes were much less likely to die. So this was very interesting, all from a site, single site, it's a small number of people, but still. So maybe people with lupus should be eating guavas and tomatoes and papayas and red peppers, red cabbage, carrots, things that will increase their, their lycopene levels. Don't know, interesting, provocative. And then antimalarials, we all use antimalarials for lupus of every kind. And I thought this was a really good, it's a massive, it's not an N of 26 or 30, massive retrospective analysis of the literature starting in 1976 all the way through 2015. And what they concluded was that your antimalarials, particularly hydroxychloroquine, which is what most of us, most of us use, will work better for acute LE little less well for subacute LE, equivalent subacute and DLE, and not quite as well for lupus profundus. And the other point that they made, which I always tell patients, and I'm sharing with you because it was in this article, you have to give it time. Antimalarials are not quick actors. You got to give it three months to see if it's going to do any good. Sometimes it's sooner, but you don't give up on the drug after three or four weeks. Treating vitiligo. They looked at mono or combination therapy and they found their best results were with an eczema laser when it was combined with twice daily application of tacrolimus, combination therapy. This one was looking at stable non-facial vitiligo. You know facial vitiligo is going to respond better to every therapeutic intervention. So this was non-facial and stable. It didn't have the confetti-like depigmentation, which says it's, it's still progressive. 
and they added bimatoprost. Yes, that's Latisse or Lumigan if you're using it to treat ophthalmologic conditions like glaucoma. They added that to either mometasone or nothing, and it turns out it's an adjunct. It's a good adjunct. The steroid alone didn't work so well. And this is what they called a good response. Uh, okay, sorta. Hydradenitis, a new way. There's no panacea here. Humira adalimumab is approved for hydradenitis, but it doesn't work on everything. Nobody works on all cases of hydradenitis. So this is a new medical method, small, 20, open label study from Greece. 100 milligrams of minocycline combined with a half milligram of colchicine twice a day. Three times a day is usually associated with gastrointestinal upset, horrible diarrhea, nausea. Twice a day usually is pretty well tolerated. Over a six month time period, every single patient either went into remission or obtained substantial improvement. I'd like to get any therapy that 20 consecutive hydradenitis patients will respond beautifully. I don't know, I'm waiting for my next one. They're getting this. And it seemed pretty, pretty reasonable. And their maintenance was with the colchicine, not with the minocycline. So that's an interesting and, again, provocative and suggestive study. And then Stevens-Johnson toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, you know, this is a pendulum. First we treated these with steroids, then we said, oh, no, no, that's bad. They're going to get infections and die. So let's use IVIG. And now the pendulum is swinging the other way. Well, maybe it isn't so bad. So this was a Chinese review, it was only 70 patients, but they found out that if you use steroids, systemic steroid, at a dose less than two milligrams per kilogram per day, that actually they did quite well. And only when you exceeded that did they have increased risk of infection and longer hospital stay. So this is an evolutionary and sometimes controversial thing. Steroids, IVIG, for these hypersensitivity reactions that are very severe. The pendulum seems to be swinging, not only in this, but in other recent literature, back towards steroids. And then low-dose isotretinoin actually will clear seborrheic dermatitis, 10 milligrams every other day, works as well or even better than topical therapy with shampoos and salicylic acid. Um, you know, that's creative coding to get it approved. This was done in Brazil where apparently they can get isotretinoin 10 milligrams every other day for bad subderm. And I'm going to turn the podium over to the next speaker, Dr. Treat.